a brief lecture to introduce your readings for week five. Specifically for this week, you are reading chapter six in the O'Leary and Hunt textbook. And this is a chapter on gathering primary data. My lecture is gonna hit on the highlights from this chapter and I'm also gonna talk about a few examples. I'm not gonna to get too much into the weeds on the specifics of the methods that they introduce because there's a lot of variation in all the different methods that you are each using for your project. So I figure you can focus on the particulars of whatever method you are using, and I'm not gonna get bogged down in that uh, in my lecture. So I think this slide says it all. Last week, we read about existing data, meaning data that's in files or archives that already exist before you begin your research. For this week, we move on to primary data, which is data that the researcher himself or herself collects. Primary data would not exist if not for your efforts as a researcher. So that's the main distinction you want to keep in mind between primary and existing data. These are the three main questions addressed in this chapter. Why do we collect primary data? How do we collect primary data? And how does data become useful information? So the main reason we collect primary data is to inform organizational decision-making. As we discussed earlier in this class, organizations that use empirical data to make decisions are typically better functioning organizations. There are many different disciplinary approaches to understanding how data can and should inform decisions. But for this class, I really encourage you to focus on not only the technical aspects of data collection, but more importantly, how data can be effectively gathered and then communicated to the relevant stakeholders in an organization in a manner that leads to effective decision-making practices. In my world, this could mean conducting a survey of recent graduates, for instance, to collect quantitative data that helps us understand which classes were most crucial in preparing them for their current jobs. Or it could mean conducting a series of focus groups with current students to collect qualitative data that informs new curricular innovations. Each of these would be an example of data-driven decision-making. The alternative, of course, would be simply to guess or to just make top-down decisions based on the preferences of current leadership. So once we know that we need it, how do we collect primary data? Easy, just like gathering wood for a campfire. But seriously, your textbook identifies three main methods, and based on your proposals, it looks like you will all be using at least one of these methods. The only other method I have added is participant observation, this has to be used carefully and systematically. In other words, you might designate specific times or events during which you're going to take field notes, and you have to respect your role and your relationship with those that you will be observing. I'm sure we have all experienced the sensation of information overload. That can occur when you have access to so much information that you don't know what to do with it or where to begin. I almost always experience that in the early phases of any research project. I like to think to some extent that's inevitable and it's part of the creative process that is integral to successful research. However, it is especially important in workplace research to make wise decisions early in the process to ensure that the data you collect will be meaningful. The textbook explains that data collection must be both targeted and appropriate. To elaborate on what is meant by targeted and appropriate research, the textbook then offers some straightforward and simple advice. This is a quotation from page 143 in your textbook, and I think it is very wise in its simplicity. When you are doing workplace research, broadly defined to include the wide variety of organizations that you are all studying in this class, you have to start by identifying who are the key players or stakeholders who possess the data that you need, then you have to figure out what is the best way to get that data from those people. 
One of the first decisions you face is whether to use a quantitative or qualitative approach. Even though it seems quite simple, the distinction that this textbook offers between quantitative and qualitative research is, I think, brilliant. I like it because they don't begin with a value judgment about one type of research being better than the other. Rather, it is tied to a decision about the nature of the question you are trying to ask. As shown on this slide, if you're asking a question that requires you to know what the masses think about something, you use quantitative methods. The result will be narrow data about a broad population, or usually some segment of that population. By using the word narrow, I don't mean to devalue that data. I'm simply saying it will be narrowly circumscribed around a particular question, such as what is the most likely outcome of the next election? By contrast, if you need to collect deeper data about a smaller number of people, then it makes sense to use qualitative methods. Again, by using the word deeper, I'm not making a value judgment. I'm just talking about data of a different nature. So, for instance, if you're trying to get to the bottom of a complex problem that's existed for a long time in your workplace, maybe, for instance, trying to understand why one team is cons consistently underperforming, even though it includes some of the most talented individuals in the organization, then interviews with team members would probably be an appropriate way to gain deep insights into the interpersonal dynamics that occur in this team. Your data will be deep insofar as they probably will not point to one single answer, but rather will reveal a complex set of factors that are interrelated in a way that will create the need for additional exploration. Your textbook provides a detailed discussion of some of the key methods that can be used to collect quantitative and qualitative data. You can read selectively in this portion of the chapter focusing on what's most relevant to your research. The, the textbook also provides a good discussion of sampling. In other words, how do you select the portion of the population you will study, whether you are using quantitative or qualitative methods to collect your data. I want to wrap up today's lecture by introducing a couple of examples of workplace research that are based on the kinds of data we've addressed in this chapter. First, this is a report conducted by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I'll go ahead and click on it to show you. This report addresses the persistent problem of sexual harassment in the STEM fields and offers a set of concrete recommendations for policymakers and organizational leaders and decision makers. Obviously, this is much bigger than the capstone report you're producing for this class, but I think it's a powerful example nonetheless. And I'm going to provide a full copy of this report for you to look at in Blackboard. And then you'll see I've also pulled out a section of the report that describes the qualitative research component. Since most of you are using some kind of qualitative method for your projects, I thought you might find this a good example, even though it is on a much larger scale than what I'm expecting for this class. This is the second example. I'm also providing a copy of this in Blackboard so you can read the full article. What's interesting about this case is that the article reports several different data collection methods that were used to solicit student feedback on a new learning model that was implemented in the business school at this university. Initial large-scale surveys suggested students were highly satisfied with this new model. However, what prompted this article is a relatively small segment of the student population circulated a petition expressing extreme dissatisfaction. The article mentions both of these forms of data and then also suggests the university may eventually conduct some student focus groups to further understand the situation. This situation shows the complexity of data in relation to organizational decision making, emphasizing that data in itself, even when it is collected in the most systematic fashion, does not always perfectly address a complex organizational problem. Why? Because we are working with humans and humans are complex and unpredictable. So that brings us to the end of, of this lecture. I'm going to turn you loose and let you resume your data collection. 
just to kind of recap where we are, last week you were supposed to be gathering some existing data that related to the chapter that we read on that last week. And for this week, I really want you to start collecting some primary data, even if it's just the very early phases of that. And then you're going to see your discussion forum for this week asks for a very detailed progress report that uh, updates me on the existing and primary data that you have gathered so far. Thanks very much, and I hope you have a great week. Thank you.